respected Swami Chaitanyanand Ji, Jeshri Ji, and this very distinguished gathering here today, I'm very grateful. I'm very grateful to the Birla Academy of Art and Culture and to Jeshri Ji personally for providing me the opportunity to hold the first official function for the release of my new book Adi Shankaracharya here in Kolkata. <clears throat> Jeshri Ji mentioned that this year according to the lunar calendar <clears throat> The Jagat Guru's birth anniversary fell on April 20th, 21st of April. And I had the great honor and privilege on those days, on April 21st, to present the first copy of this book to Mahayamayam Rashpatiji. <coughs> the official release of the book in Delhi by Dr. Karan Singh and Dr. Murli Manohar Joshi is on the 2nd of May. But the first release function is in Kolkata. And I am happy for that, that in this city of great history, deep thought, depth of knowledge, and traditions of cerebral energy, I am launching the book here. This is my 21st book. And I'm often asked why after books on such varied subjects as a biography of Mirza Ghalib, an analysis of the Indian middle class, a contemplation of what it is to be Indian, being Indian, what are the reasons for becoming Indian, which was another of my books, a book on Chanakya, a novel, several translations, a book on Krishna, a long book of poetry on Yudhishthir and Draupadi. Why I now wrote on Adi Shankaraja? I think one of the reasons was that Hinduism is a Sanatanta. It has no one hope, no one temple, no one text, no one prescriptive ritual, no one mandatory form of congregation. It is the way of life. And all those who belong to this great religion, which has flowed unbroken for millennia, practice it in their own ways. But somewhere precisely because there is no one text and no one prescribed ritual, many of us as practicing Hindus become somewhat adrift from the remarkable philosophical underpinnings of our own religion. And I think Hinduism as a religion and as a grand edifice of thought cannot be separated. Unless you know Hinduism not only as you practice it, but Hinduism through the great philosophy that underpins it, of the remarkable cerebral energy that has gone into defining the whole vision of Hinduism. You cannot really ever understand the greatness of Hinduism. And so it was a labor of love. A labor of love to resurrect once again, not in its entirety, but certainly through one of the greatest thinkers Hinduism has produced. And in fact, the subtitle of this book is Hinduism's Greatest Thinker. To resurrect once again some idea of that great 
reservoir of sheer compressed cerebral energy that goes into structuring the philosophy that underpins Hinduism as a practice religion. Adi Shankaracharya is a first fascinating personality. He was born in Kerala and Kalari in the 8th century and took Samadhi in Kedarnath during a short life of 32 years he traveled by foot the length and breadth of this country as many as three times in that short period he not only went back with a rigor of thought which is unparalleled in the creation of philosophical structures to the great Upanishads, to the great Upanishadic insights, but also, as Swamiji mentioned, organized religion, Hinduism, through the four muts which he set up, one in the south in Shingeri, in Dwaraka, in Puri, east and west, and one in the north in Joshimari. So the civilizational unity of India existed millennia before the British claimed they had created it. Winston Churchill once said that to say that India is a nation is to say the equator is a nation. He should have known what the civilizational unity of Bharat Varsh was. And during this life, which is fascinating in its details, but which few people know about, I sought to pursue a personal journey of discovery. I went to Kalati. His house is there. It has been traced on the banks of the river Perida. And from there I traveled to Omkareshwar on the Narbada, where he went to his first guru, Govindapal. And the journey that he made from Kerala to Madhya Pradesh in uncharted territory in those days, in itself is a remarkable achievement. What are the navigational skills? How did the knowledge of gurus from so far away reach Kerala. What was the form of communication? We must be pushed by a curiosity to know. To know more than what is obvious. What was the common thread between a Namudri Brahmin boy growing up in Kerala near Kochi to what Go Govindapad and his father Godapad were writing in Nar on the Narvada in Om Karesh. But that is where he went and I visited Omkarish. And the Kufa is still there where it is said that Govindapad was sitting in deep meditation when Shankaracharya as a young boy of eight arrives there on foot. And all that Govindapad asks him, who are you? And then Adi Shankaracharya replies, Chidananda Rupa Shivoham Shivoham. I am not any of this. Mano Buddhi Ankara Chittani Nahi. None of this. All I am is bliss and awareness. Chit Anand. Sat Chit Anand. And it is said that Govindapada extended his foot outside the cave. Adi Shankaracharya touched it and he accepted him as a pupil. And after three years of staying in that Gurukul, he goes to the Harvard of philosophy, which is Kashi, where all philosophers congregate and there is discussion and dialogue and debate. And at Kashi he stays and there he writes his commentary on the Brahma Sutra, the Shankar Bhashi. 
There are three foundational texts of Hinduism we were just discussing before this program began. The Upanishads. And the Upanishads are, imagine this, imagine in your mind, 2000 years, 2500 years before the birth of Christ, forest academies, where seers and sages whose names are unknown, sat with a group of students as committed to the quest of cosmic truth as their guru. And a dialogue and a conversation takes place. And in the Upanishads, these gurus then elliptically, almost incidentally, almost merely by indication, provide a window to great insights into cosmic truths. And that is the Upanishads. They are not an organized compendium of thought as a philosophy. They are insights. And these gurus were not Srishti Chintas. They were not talking about what and how this universe is. They were talking about what and how underpins this universe. Paramarthic Chintak. Their Chinta was Paramarthic. They were transcendentalists. They were metaphysicians who were talking to their students and the insights they provided, although scattered, not put together as organized thought, became our heritage. And along with the Upanishads, we have the Brahma Sutra. The Brahma Sutra's 550 aphorisms are each of each aphorism is so short that you cannot compress it any further. The first is just this, Adhatu Brahmachikyasa. Now, let us begin an exploration of Brahma. And then 4,000 shlokas will be written as a commentary on just this much. They used to say in those times that if you could reduce this Max Miller essay, if you could reduce that aphorism by one syllable or one letter more, it gave the same pleasure as the birth of a son in a family. That was the intense compression of thought into that short aphorism. And then commentaries were written on it which would fill up volumes. So there were the Brahma Sutras and there was the Bhagavad Gita. They say these are the three foundational texts of Hindu. And Shankaracharya, Adi Shankaracharya wrote commentaries on all of them. And in Varanasi he wrote on them. And then he traveled. He was a peripatetic teacher. He was not meant to be in one place. In fact, as a child when he began to show signs of not only being a child prodigy, because by the age of three he had memorized all the texts that could be memorized in Sanskrit. And he showed an inclination of renunciation. His mother, who was a widow, was exceptionally worried that her only child would leave or was becoming an ascetic. And she even tried to somehow get him married and settle down. But the urge within you when it is so powerful and strong, and in the case of Adi Shankaracharya, he made no secret of it. But there was the tie with his mother, who was left alone with no other progeny except him. So the story goes that once when he was crossing the river, he shouted out to his mother that, Mother, my foot has been caught by a crocodile. And let give me the permission to adopt sannyas, otherwise I will die. And his mother, at this moment, when the very life of her child is at stake, hesitates but then decides, yes, you may go. And then Adi Shankaracharya, the crocodile. Now, this is maybe apoc apocryphal. Fables and legends are created and survive because they reinforce a central point. And that central point here was that Adi Shankaracharya was born with that inclination towards leading the life of an ascetic in the pursuit of truth, not merely renunciation. 
To renounce is easy, but to use that renunciation in the pursuit of truth or in the search for what you believe to be the truth. That was his quest and his mother gives him permission and even today next to his house in Kaladi in Kerala there is a ghat which is called Crocodile Ghat. Even today it survives as a symbol of that particular anecdote. But nevertheless you will read, it's a personal journey. I and in most of that, my wife, we travelled to Kashi, we went to naturally the four dhams, Dwarka, Puri, Yoshanmat and Shingeri. We went also to Kanchi, which claims to be set up by Adi Shankaracharya too. We went to Kedarnath, to Badrinath and many other places associated with Adi Shankaracharya to try and get a sense of putting together fact against anecdote, anecdote against legend, legend against fable, mythology against reality and structure a life based on a personal journey. And that is what constitutes the first chapter of this book, which is a form of a personal journey. But before Adi Shankaracharya came, and this is important to all of those, and I don't speak here only of Hindus. Adi Shankaracharya, if we accept that he is born in 788, he inherited a background. You can't just begin to write on Advait out of nothing. And that background itself is remarkable. There were 2000 years before Adi Shankaracharya, as I mentioned to you the Upanishads, six systems of Hindu philosophy. The Nyay, the Vaisheshik, the Sankhya, the Yog, the Purvimanch, the Uttarvimanch. And each of them had a corpus of thought of application of mind, of a point of view, and each of them in their own way were searching, not necessarily, and this is important, for Ishwar or God as we know, but for that absolute which defines the difference between the eternal and the transient, the permanent and the impermanent, the real and the unreal. That was the quest. In fact, five of the six systems of Hindu philosophy can be described as technically atheist. They are not talking of God. And in addition to them, and the dialogue between them, there was the great dialogue between these schools, Hinduism and Jainism and Buddhism, and in addition, to explain to you the remarkably eclectic canvas of Hinduism, there were all forms of schools, including the Charvak school, which said, what we see is what is real. Jo pratyaksha vohi satya. Who said the Vedas are rubbish. The Vedas are a means by which the priestly class manipulates the masses. 2000 years before Marx said religion is the opium of the masses. This is what the Charvak school could say. There was the Tantric school. There were other Agama texts. So, taken together, Hinduism as a body of thought covered a canvas which was the legacy with Adi Sankaracharya inherited and he was a Vedantin. He believed in the Advait school of thought which is uncompromising non-duality in terms of defining the absolute. And there is a very audacious leap of thought. At a time when people were defining divinity in familiar terms as godhood, which has got hands and face and features and attributes which we know about, here was the notion of Brahm. Brahm, which is 
पूर्ण विच इज ऑल परवेस एकम एक स्वर्ग व्यापी ब्रह्म विच इज नो एट्रीब्यूट विच इज निर्व ब्रह्म विच इज इंडिविजिबल अखंड ब्रह्म विच इज बियॉन्ड थॉट अचिंत Brahm, which is unseen, adrist. Brahm, which is all-knowing, sarva pratyaya darshanin. Brahm, which is undifferentiated consciousness, nirvishesh chin matra. Brahm, which is neti neti. Not this, not this, because any attempt to define it by the human mind circumscribes it. Brahm is all pervasive conscious urja or energy infinite eternal omnipotent omnipresent immanent in all of us pervading the cosmos it's a remarkable audacity of thought attributeless nirgun and that conceptualizes remarkable for its times remarkable have i done anything wrong that's remarkable and from there then comes a structure of philosophical thought that is the real and what is within us there is an ansh the atma the atman the atman and the brahm are the same that is the second audacity of thought as cognitive beings and it's a, it's a, it's a very i want to say to you this is a very very rigorous analysis the body is analyzed the mind is analyzed what distinguishes us from other living beings is that humans have the cognitive faculty of the mind which consists the manas which consists of buddhi intellect ahamkar the sense of ego and chit the potential of awareness and when that awareness within you that unseen often hidden mostly neglected in the shadows observer within you the sakshi when that is allowed to emerge that atma is the same as brahm characterized by the same attributes which are there by inference which is sat existence chit sat chit anand existence bliss awareness that is in me that is outside then what prevents this which is essentially the same this great immanence called brahm then what is this plur bewildering plurality around us after all in one of his couplets ghalib says jab ke tujh bin nahi koi maujood to ye hangama ye khuda kya hai ye pari chehre log kaise what is all this bewildering plurality and adi shankaracharya's answer and the answer of the vedantic school of thought is that this reality exists but is not real in absolute terms that which is transient cannot be real that which is real cannot be transient it is not that it doesn't exist it is it is it exists but is given a sense of absolute reality by us who have neglected the atma within us and are therefore overtaken by what is a term which is used in advait philosophy which is called avidya ignorance and ignorance is due to three kinds or three reasons one is of course the limitations of our own sensory faculties please understand that essentially you who are sitting there are just empty space and waves we see you as real through our sensory faculties 
We see you as real through our sensory faculties. But far more importantly, far more importantly, it's the mind. The mind is never still. It's a great tool. It's powerful. But the mind is like a monkey jumping from one branch to another. It is never still. It never allows that moment of contemplation, of stillness, of awareness, which allows you in some manner to rediscover who you really are. And if the mind is like that, the sense of ahamkar, the ego, which is a completely simulated and false creation of the mind, that may who or may nahi hu to kuch bhi nahi The sense of I-ness, that combined with what the mind is, which is permanently agile, never still. If you can keep your mind empty for exactly 30 seconds, you are a practiced meditationer, but it can't happen. And so the combination of the two, buddhi and ahamkar, creates a process of avidya where we mistake the truth to be what is not the real. It's like the analogy all of you are aware of, of the serpent and the rope. The rope is the truth. What we perceive or believe is the serpent. Until we correct, until we are able to correct that perception that serpent exists, it ceases to exist and becomes the rope only when our perception changes. And that perception changes when avidya is conquered. And that avidya is conquerable for us to understand that we are essentially undiluted bliss, undiluted awareness, undiluted joy. That is our inherent nature. Somewhere, because of that process of avaran, which is concealment, and vikshep, which is distortion, there occurs a dosha, a mistake of perception. That perception has to be rectified and then you are capable of Brahm Anubhav. That Anubhav which confers undiluted, inextricable, inexpressible bliss. That is Advaita philosophy. And then the question may arise because it's a logical process. It's a very logical process. That if this is the case, and this is why this bewildering plurality exists, why do we need to have this bewildering plurality in the first place? Are we Brahm hai or Atma hai? Dono khush hai, aap bhi khush ho, mein bhi khush ho, ya beech mein, iski zarwat kya hai? And Shankaracharya's answer is, Leela. It is anirvachniya, inexpressible. That is inexpressible, but the way out of it is known through vichar, reflection, vimarsh, through mimansh, through dhyan, through shravan, manan and meditation. You can. And he was a votary of the jnana mark, the redemption through the path of knowledge. In fact, during his lifetime, Swamiji, his biggest debate was not against the Buddhists. In fact, Buddhism was in decline by then. Buddhism and Hinduism are very similar. Except that Buddhism starts with the beach word Dukkha and the way out of sorrow. And Hinduism's beach word is Anand, joy. You are joy, become joy again. That's the only difference. But I'm not going into that. His real Shastra, and this is important, the manner in which you resolve disputes was not by pointing a gun at somebody's head and saying either you agree with what I say or I'll kill you. The manner was Shastra, debate, dialogue, discussion, the ability to listen. 
and the biggest debate of Adi Shankar Acharya's time, which whole, held the whole of Bharat Varsh in thrall, was between him and Mandan Mishra. Mandan Mishra was the foremost believer of the Purva Mivat school, which believed in Karmkan, which said that merely following Vedic ritual in its prescribed format leads to moksha and Shankaracharya contested that, that it's not Karmakand but Gyanamarg which is the way to salvation. And that debate took place and we travelled from Omkareshwar to Maheshwar Swamiji, there are at least three places identified where that debate took place. Even today. And you visit them and there are signboards and who was the empire in this debate? It was Mandan Mish's wife. As everyone knows, this is a famous story. So, she was the empire. And finally, Adi Shankaracharya wins the debate but then she says, he has lost but I am a part of him. Ardhanarishwar. So therefore, I will debate with you also and that's another story which is very interesting in itself because she asks him questions of Kama Shastra and he has no answers as a sannyasin. Then he takes 30 days and comes back and how he learns is another story and how he almost doesn't come back is another story. But that we talk about, he had to be reminded about it and that again incident. Incidentally, nothing in Hindu philosophy or mythology is random. If there is a Maryada Purushottam Ram, there will be a Leela Purushottam Krishna. If there is a Sita, there will be a Radha. There are four Purushat, Dharma, Artha, Kama, Moksha. They will all have a role. Even Vatsyayan is asked in the first chapter of the Kama Sutra, which is not about impossible postures. Why do we need this book? And this is again a, a reflection of the dialogue that takes place in Hinduism all the time. He is asked and he allows it to be written because he is writing it that why do you need this book? And the answer he gives is that there are four Purusharts in life, Dharma, Artha, Kama, Moksha. Each of the first three pursued in proportion and none in exclusion leads automatically to the last in a balanced life which is Moksha. So there is place for dharma, there is place for earth material well-being, there is place for calm, which is the pursuit of sensuality, but each in proportion, none in exclusion, and you will reach moksha. So if there is place for calm, philosophical validity for the pursuit of the sensual, then it's not enough to be just a lover, you must be an accomplished lover, therefore the book. So in any case, I was giving this as obiter dicta on the side, but even Shankaracharya, in a sense illustrates it because when he has this discussion with Mandan Mishra's wife, he is knowledgeable even about that aspect of life which is important, which you may renounce but which you cannot negate. And that has a lesson in itself. But the amazing thing apart from his philosophy, by the way, Brahm, Anubhav can happen to anyone at any time. I give examples, Swamiji, in the book. Starting from Swami Ramakrishna to so many others. It is as if, as I was saying to somebody before this, Jnana Mark prepares you for it. And all the other forms that we normally practice as Hinduism in a way of life, Shankaracharya says, are valid as part of two forms of knowledge. One is Paravidya, which is transcendental knowledge. The other is Aparavidya, which is Vyavahari, which is the practical knowledge. And under that, Bhakti, Prayer, Prapatti, Surrender, all of them, Yoga, they all have their own place. You can pursue them. There is nothing wrong with them. In fact, they prepare you through and with Gyan for that possibility of Brahm Anubhav. The experience of Brahm which can only be remembered as bliss and awareness. So they all have a place. This was a slate of hand. 
by Adi Shankaracharya. He was also a great synthesizer. He took along other traditions without diluting the chastity of his own rigorous philosophical logic. But he took along. He took along those other things, but he maintained also that in spite of all of this, at a split moment, if the antenna moves and you are in the same wavelength with that all pervasive cosmic consciousness, you can go, you can experience that Brahman. It's an intuitional moment, a moment of absolute intuition, some yag darshan, perfect intuition. It can happen to you, me, anybody at any time. But the last thing I want to speak about today is how science is validating so much about Brahman. And that was my most fascinating chapter. Because these days it has become fashionable to correlate anything in the past or rather in the future or present to great achievements by India in the past from plastic surgery to artificial insemination to internet to so on. But let's not reduce the refinements of thought to juvenile chauvinism. Let us examine empirically and every aspect of Brahm as defined is today being validated by the latest discoveries of science in the areas of cosmology, of quantum physics and neurology. Adi Shankaracharya says Brahm by definition is infinite, immeasurable, amatra. Today, the eyes in the sky we have, the telescopes tell us that we are part of the Milky Way, one galaxy. That galaxy is 150,000 light years across. Light travels at the speed of 300,000 kilometers per second. This galaxy of which we are a part is 150,000 light years away. But today science tells us, cosmology tells us that there are at least 125 billion more such galaxies, each with at least 200 billion stars, which are twice the size of the sun. And this universe that we know, which is already mind-boggling in its infinitude, is expanding every second at the speed of light. In other words, if you put three dots on a balloon and blow air into it, the dots will begin to expand. That is how the universe is expanding. And Stephen Hawking says that this expanding unbelievably infinite universe, there is nothing to say that there are not but one universe, but multiverses. So Brahmand ka concept to Brahm se aaya tha, infinity. Cosmology is proving it. Brahm is eternal. Anadi Anand. Today, cosmology is this, is is saying that the current universe as we know it is 13.7 billion years old. Our sun itself is 5 billion years old. And everything is supposed to have begun, some scientists believe, from the Big Bang. When a immeasurably area of smallest possible density went into revolutionary expansion to create this vast cosmos. But equally scientists are accepting that if there was the Big Bang, there could be a rewind of a film to a big crunch. And then there would be a Big Bang again. And the cycle is eternal. Srishti Sthiti Pranay. It is being validated by modern science. Brahm 
is infinitely intelligent. Adi Shankaracharya says it's like salt in water. The water tastes salty. That is the nature of Brahm. Everything in this cosmos for all its vastness runs to a finite order of a one-tenth of a second to the fiftieth power. Otherwise the universe will collapse onto itself. We know exactly when the moon will rise, when the sun will set. Brahm says, the definition of Brahm is that it is akhand, it is indivisible. Today experiments have been carried out, I'll only mention one, it's called the EPR experiment, the einstein podolsky rosen experiment, where two electrons, if they they, if, if they are on the same axis, will rotate at the same speed but counterwise or clockwise. And you take one electron here and you take the other to Seattle or to the moon. And the moment you put them in the same axis, they rotate counterwise or clockwise. Is This is faster than the speed of light. There is no way there can be communication. The universe is indivisible. It is a khand. That was the definition of Brahm. Brahm spoke of consciousness, this urja being pervaded by consciousness. I am giving you snapshots only. The rest is in the book. This consciousness. Today scientists, be it Nobel laureates like Max Planck, Edwin Schrodinger, they are saying that consciousness is primary, what is material is derivative. That this great energy cannot exist without a foundational consciousness underpinning, underpinning it, of which we are a part and everything else is a part. Everything is a manifestation of that consciousness. I am not saying it. Nobel laureate physicists who have studied it and have come to a full stop where science stops are putting down in cold ink on paper that there is a primary consciousness pervading the universe. Brahm spoke of Atman and Brahm being the same. Today, in Harvard, in neurology labs, Experiments are being carried out of those who practice meditation. One of them is very interesting. It is done by Andrew Newberg in a book which he's written called Why God Won't Die. Here is a practiced meditationer who just before he is going into the deepest meditation has a string tied to his finger. And there are scientists now in this neurology lab behind the panel and just as he is about to slip into the deepest moments of meditation he gives a little tug on that finger alerting the scientists and they are carrying out a speck of his brain and they find how the colors of the brain begin to change and the most active area of the brain, which is called the association area, that begins to acquire cooler colors of blue and green, softer colors. And then these scientists have concluded that the world is animated by something called absolute unitary being. And that in fact consciousness within us there is an inherent ability within us of a material substance called the brain to produce a transcendence which transcends that materialism of the brain. In other words, there is an observer within us. And when that observer goes into deep meditation, all barriers that are man-made, all divisions, all sense of I-ness merges, diffuses, dissolves into a sense of complete identification with an all-pervasive consciousness. That has been demonstrated by science. So I have tried to show, without reducing such analogies to the level of uh, 
what I call the Dina but Dinanath Bhatra School of History, to actually try and understand whether what somebody saw through a philosopher's eye is being validated by what scientists are seeing today through microscopes and telescopes. And there is a correlation. And that is the most one of the most remarkable things that you can you can give credit to to the great philosophers and seers and sages who who have given the foundation to Hinduism as we know it. So we began with uh, Vajagovindam and I will end with it because what does he say? And I want to give an example here. In Vajagovindam, Adi Shankaracharya says, Shariram Swarupam Sada Roga Muktam Sucharu Charitram Dhanam Merutri you may have a beautiful body, shariram, sarupam, sada roga muktam, and remain always healthy. Sucharu charitram, be lauded for your character. Dhanam, and be wealthy enough like the mountain of Meru, your treasures. Manishyene, um, what is the line, Swamiji? Guru Agna Padme. Manushchena lagnam guru pargada padme tathakim 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 So long as you do not fall at the worship the lotus feet of your guru to what a whale, to what a whale, to what a whale, to what a whale. Guru Ashtakam. Guru Ashtakam. And in Bhaja Govindam, he actually writes the most lyrical hymn of Bhakti. But the same Shankaracharya, and I will end with this, in Nirvana Shatakam says, Namai Raga Dvesha, Namai Moha Loba, Mado Naiva Mai Naiva Matsarya Bhava, Na Dharmo, Na Chartho, Na Kamo, Na Moksha. He denies all the four Purusharts of Hinduism. What remains? Chidananda Rupa, Shivoham, Shivoham. In bliss and awareness, I am Shiva. I am Shiva. Na punyam, na papam, na sokhyam, na dukham, na mantra, na tirtham, na vedo, na yagna. There is no mantra, there is no tirth, there is no ved, there is no yagna. Aham bhojyanam neva bhojyam na bhokta. Jidananda rupa shivoham shivoham. This is the truth, this is the truth. Namaya Vritti Shankar. And look at what he said about the Guru. And this is what he says now. Namay Mrityu Shankar, Namay Jati Bheda. Pita Naiva Mai Naiva Mata Na Jagma. I am neither father nor mother, nor was I ever born. Na Bandhur Na Mitram, Guru Naiva Shishya. There is neither Bandhu nor Mitram, nor Guru nor Shishya. The same man who wrote Tathakim, Tathakim, Tathakim. This is the remarkable iconoclasm of great thinkers. Only thing that remains, Chidananda Rupa, Shivoham, Shivoham. Thank you so much. Good evening, sir. I'm towards your left. Mr. sir. So you were, uh, this is a little bit of from history, not more of religious philosophy. You talked about plurality. And uh, coming to that, that it is in history, many historians talk about it, that Adi Shankaracharya and his philosophy is also considered to be one of the motivating factors for Brahmins to prosecute Buddhists. How far is that true? Thank you. Actually, what happened was that after Adi Shankaracharya, there were some, not biographies, but hagiographies written about him, which were called the Vijayam, Shankar the Vijayams, which uh, dwelt almost entirely on two aspects of Adi Shankaracharya's life. One was the miracles he is supposed to perform as the avatar of Shiva, which are uh, more uh, motivated to faith than to logic. And the second was to see him as an avatar who vanquished Buddhism. In my view, both are exaggerated. 
By the time he, the date subscribed to him, Buddhism was in decline. Yes, he disagreed with certain aspects or tenets of Buddhism. For instance, later interpretation of Buddhism by Nagarjun and others was that of Shunyat, void. And Shankaracharya said, Brahm can never be a void because it is suffused by bliss and awareness. Now, I'm just simplifying it for you one difference. But he had differences with other schools of Hindu philosophy also. I just mentioned to you Karam Kant. He had differences with Samkhya, with Yoga, with Nyaya Vaisheshik. So there is nothing very special and certainly I do not believe that he organized Hinduism to persecute, persecute Buddhists. It is factually, in my view, untrue. Uh, after this uh, very entertaining uh, speech, I want to have one question and your reflection I want to hear, though it is a very difficult one. Uh, Adi Sankaracharya is considered as the incarnation of Shiva. And in his, uh, um, I mean, uh, first life, uh, he had uh, the Daitas. Daita, uh, in, in the uh, anecdote of uh, Chandalo and uh, Sankaracharya, and Narendranath, who was also considered to be the incarnation of Shiva, and in his first life also he was a non-believer of God. But after that, the transformation of uh, Sankara in the uh, Advaita philosophy, it is transformed. And the same thing happened in Vivekananda also under uh, Ramakrishna. So, can you give uh, some reflection on this factor? The change of Dvaita uh, to Advaita and the uh, um, Narendra's change from non-believer to the very believer in this context. Well, sir, all I can say is that from my study, Shankaracharya, Adi Shankaracharya was from his inception and till he died a believer in the Advaita philosophy. But he also conceded that at the Vyavaharic level, at the level of Upper Avidya, you can be followers of Ishwar, prayer, devotion, surrender, even Tirthas, so long as they are not done with the motive of abhyuday, which is personal gain or reward. If it is done with the spirit of sacrifice, it only prepares you and reinforces the gyan mark for that moment of Brahm Anubhav where you realize the truth. In my view, that was the consistent aspect of his philosophy. Hello, sir. I have a question to you. Many books on Adi Shankaracharya published by different publishers in different languages in India. What is your uniqueness of your book and in your writings? I think so. I think you should read it, your clients. <laughs> but what is important from my point of view is that this book, and I have to thank my publishers, uh, Amazon Westland, will be published uh, in uh, it's been published in English. In a few days, the Hindi version will be out. It will be published in Malayalam, Tamil, Telugu, Kannad, Gujarati, Bengali, and Marathi. Wonderful. But I just have one small, small query 
I couldn't follow. That's not your fault, my fault. I couldn't follow the point about Guru. One is the Guru, he is asking for to ask to feet and to fall at the feet of the Guru. Or he is saying there is no Guru, there is no Shishu. What is actually is. Because this Guru Bhag always puzzles me. It's a good question. I think I was given examples to show that at one level for Adi Shankaracharya neither a Guru nor Mantra nor Tirtham nor Yagna nor Ritual nor Prayer mattered because all that matters is Brahm as understood through Sat, 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 Sat Chit Anand. So that is all. Nothing else matters. That's why there's a difference with Karam Kand or prescriptive ritual. But at another level, which he grants, is below the Paramarthic level, which is the Srishti Chintak level, which I have explained is the upper avidya or the level and the practical person. You know, uh, it's very interesting. The notion of Brahm is intellectually very aloof. All of us as human beings want a deity to whom you can go and pray and hope for benediction. And Adi Shankaracharya understood this need. So he said at the lower level of knowledge, you, if you need it, there is nothing wrong in it, but it should be done with a sense of sacrifice and genuine Atma Samarpan, which is Surrender and prapatti, which is complete devotion. If done like that, it prepares you for that higher knowledge, which is your real uh, And that means uh, Jiddu Krishnamurti is the modern, actual follower of Adi Shankara Church. <clears throat> Actually, the Vedant school has many modern philosophers who in their own way have interpreted it. Certainly J. Krishnamurti and very interestingly Shri Prasanna Ji, scientists like uh, Edwin Schrodinger etc. were greatly influenced by Krishnamurti and they acknowledge it. Uh, but I would say even the Norwegian philosopher Eckhart Tolle, the power of now, it's pure Vedanta. It's pure Vedanta. He himself describes what happened to him. One morning he got up and he was full of his own anxieties and certainly, and that description is given in this book, where that moment of Brahma Anubhav takes place. And for, he said, for two years I remained in absolute ecstasy. And gradually, gradually I came back to real life. Everything seemed beautiful to me. I was suffused with a new love. And my whole perception of things changed with that one moment. Anyway, but he, he reiterates Vedan, Eckhart Tolle. In one, at one level, I must tell you, even though there are people who have different interpretations of the human being, Osho again speaks of the same sense of breaking the barriers of conventional human thinking in order to have the intuitive insight of the Absolute. So there are many, but you are right about J. Krishna. Wonderful, Panji again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Friends, thank you for joining us. It has been a very pleasant meeting. Please join us for refreshments outside the auditorium. Thank you.